Welcome back chemists. In this video we are going to look at acids and see our first examples of reaction mechanisms. Uh, first let's review some things you should know from your past chemistry class. An acid is a species that can contribute an H plus ion, such as just the generic formula HA dissociating to give H plus and what we call the conjugate base, A minus. We can talk about this equilibrium in terms of its acidity constant, that's just the equilibrium constant, the concentration of H plus and A minus multiplied together, divided by the concentration of HA. And for weak acids, this is a pretty small numerical value, because this dissociation doesn't happen to a significant extent. We quantify this a little bit differently by using what's called a pKa, that's just the negative logarithm of the Ka value, and that essentially just gives us easier numbers to look at. Instead of 10 to the negative 5 for a Ka value, we could consider a pKa of just 5. And then it's easier to compare pKa's with each other when we're talking about relative strength or weakness of acids. So, weak acids, in summary, have small Ka values. That means they turn into large pKa values. What I really want you to take home is that they are more stable. When something is weak in terms of chemistry, that means it's not very reactive. So it's very stable, conversely. And when we look at chemical reactions, they tend toward the more stable thing. So let's apply this to some organic reactions that involve acids and bases, starting with what are called Bronsted acids and bases. These are the ones that donate and receive hydrogen ions. Here I have an example that shows acetic acid and ammonia probably already know acetic acid, because of the name, acts as an acid. Ammonia is one of the most common examples of a weak base. So what would the products be if I reacted acetic, acetic acid with ammonia? Well, the acid will give up its H plus ion, and you'll get what's called acetate. This is also called the conjugate base, and that's just what this species looks like once it's lost that H, specifically the H right there attached to the oxygen. Notice there's a negative charge on that oxygen as well because we've lost not just H, but H plus, and the electrons are still with the, the conjugate. What about the ammonia? What happens to that? Well, it's a base. Bases take an H plus. So NH3 is gonna become NH4 with a net positive charge. That'll actually be a formal charge on the nitrogen atom. We're gonna do one more thing since we're doing organic mechanisms starting today. We're gonna use a curved arrow to signify how electrons have changed in this reaction. So remember a curved arrow like that means two electrons and just like we use them for resonance contributors, we use them to show which bonds form and which bonds break in an organic reaction. So what bond broke and what bond formed in this combination? Well, there's a new bond between the nitrogen and this hydrogen. Where did the electrons in that bond come from? They came from the nitrogen. There's a lone pair on that nitrogen atom. So I'm gonna draw an arrow from that lone pair to the H. That arrow means a new bond is formed between that nitrogen and the hydrogen. It is a very common misconception, incorrect way uh, of drawing an arrow from the H to the N, but the arrow doesn't signify where the atoms go. It signifies where the electrons have changed. And as a result, atoms are in different places. That's the bond that formed. What bond broke? Well, the OH bond broke, and the electrons from that bond ended up on the oxygen. If you can't see that too easily, take a look at the electrons that used to be on this oxygen. There's two lone pairs on that oxygen atom, but over here, because of the formal charge, there are now three. So that bond between the OH broke, and it ends up on the oxygen itself. And that's your first organic reaction mechanism, using curved arrows to show how bonds break and bonds form. We're gonna do this all year long, as we learn how reactions work, so we can ultimately learn how we can control reactions and make useful things for society. That's what organic chemistry is all about. Let's try the one right below it. This one uses the acetate ion that we just made in the previous reaction. That negatively charged species is what's gonna act as our base. Right next to it, the methanol molecule will act as your acid, if it's hard to tell. Remember that things that are negatively charged tend to be more basic than things that are neutral, and certainly more so than things that are positively charged. So the base is going to pick up an H plus and become the conjugate acid, in this case, an acetic acid molecule. The acid, methanol, is gonna lose an H plus and become methoxide, CH3O negative. And now let's go back and draw curved arrows to show the bonds that formed and the bonds that broke. The bond that formed is between this oxygen and this hydrogen, and the electrons came from the oxygen. So draw an arrow from that oxygen to that hydrogen. The bond that broke is this one right here between the oxygen and the hydrogen. So draw an arrow from that OH bond directly to the oxygen. 
Okay, that's the first two. So now I'd like you to hit pause and try the next one. There's a hydrofluoric acid molecule and a dihydrogen phosphate anion. Uh, which species is the acid? Which species is the base? What are the products? And then draw curved arrows to show how the bonds have changed. Okay, well, let's see how you did. So HF, hydrofluoric acid, that's your acid. The anion is your base. Our products, HF is gonna lose an H plus and become F minus. And the dihydrogen phosphate anion is gonna gain an H plus and become phosphoric acid, which looks like that. Lastly, our curved arrows. Uh, we formed a bond between the oxygen and this hydrogen. And we broke a bond between the H and the F and the electrons go on the fluorine. Okay, so that's how we draw very simple reaction mechanisms using curved arrows to show how, in this case, an acid and base become a different pair of ions and products. One thing that we haven't addressed yet, though, is how do we know that this reaction even works? Does this actually go in the forward reaction? We're just writing them hypothetically. But many of these are reversible, and it's worth mentioning which side is the more predominant side. And this is where we need to talk about stability of acids or strength versus weakness of acids. When we look at acid strength, we usually talk about pKa values, which is a quantified, a quantified way of talking about how strong it is, how much it dissociates. And this chart gives us a ranking from the weakest acids on the left to the strongest acids on the right. Oops. Strongest. And eventually you're going to memorize these pK values because this gives us a quick way of figuring out how strong or how weak a certain type of hydrogen is in a molecule. Starting with just this CH4 molecule, that's indicative of the, P, uh, the pKa of an alkane. Not very acidic at all. That's a pretty high pKa value, 50. Uh, right next to it is what's called an alkene. An H on a carbon-carbon double bond is also not very acidic. The ammonia molecule is an example of an amine. It's just a hydrogen attached to a nitrogen in this case. Not very acidic. In fact, you should remember ammonia is most commonly thought of as a base. A little more acidic than that would be a ketone right next to it, pKa of 25. It's about the same as the pKa of an alkyne. And then you're getting into much more acidic things when you look at a water molecule or the H of an alcohol. These are just rough approximations of a pKa value. They represent orders of magnitude. It's a logarithmic scale. But most alcohols have pKa's roughly in the range of 16. However, the one right next to it is an exception. This is an OH attached to a benzene, what's called a phenol, much more acidic with a pKa of 10. The conjugate acid of an amine, what's called an ammonium ion, is even more acidic, pKa of 9. And at about the same acidity is this diketone. After that, we'll see a lot of those in Orga 2. We look at what's called enolate chemistry. And then we're getting into really acidic things like carboxylic acid, roughly pKa of 5, followed by hydronium and sulfuric acid. This is an inorganic strong acid you should know from your general chemistry class with very small pKa values. So small that they're frankly very difficult to measure and quantify. So take those with a little bit of a grain of salt. So let's use these to talk about which way a potential equilibrium might lie. Does the reaction even go? So here's the reaction of a carboxylate with methanol to make a carboxylic acid and a alkoxide. And I want to do uh, what we did above, label the acid and base. We have a base with this carboxylate and methanol is acting as an acid. How can I tell? Follow the H. The H was picked up by the base, so I know that the species is the base. Furthermore, it's negatively charged. I'm gonna label the products as well and call this thing the conjugate acid, followed by the conjugate base. But the key words here really are base versus acid. And to figure out which way this equilibrium lies, we just have to compare the two acids and look at their, rel their relative strengths. The pKa of methanol, that's an alcohol, the pKa is roughly 16, and the pKa of a carboxylic acid is roughly 5. And the one that I'm concerned with is not the stronger one, but the weaker one, because the weaker one is more stable, and that's going to tell us which way this equilibrium lies. So who is more stable? 16. Higher pKa, more stable acid. Higher pKa equals more stable 
and that tells us which way this equilibrium actually goes. So even though it's arbitrarily written left to right here, this equilibrium really goes to the left. So I'm gonna put a big leftward arrow showing that these things predominate. Now, why did we compare the two acids with each other? Could we compare the bases? Absolutely. Bases have KB and PKB values, uh, but I don't have those in front of me, and that's the first answer. Uh, however, I could compare the bases, and we could do it qualitatively. It turns out that this base is also a more stable base than the other one. So luckily it leads to the same answer, and that should always happen every time. Why is that? Why is this anion on this particular oxygen better than this anion on this oxygen? They're both oxygen anions. What would make the one on the left more stable? Well, it has to do with what we talked about yesterday. Yesterday, we looked at resonance, and this anion on the carboxylate is resonance stabilized. That means I can delocalize that negative charge up into the other oxygen. So that negative charge is partially on the oxygen on the right, but it's also partially on the oxygen up there. So both oxygen atoms get to share the load of that negative charge. Remember, nature hates charges, and if we can delocalize electrons to distribute the charge throughout the molecule, it makes for a more stable substance. The anion on the right, the methoxide anion, doesn't have any resonance, so that's just an isolated negative charge sitting on an oxygen atom. So that means we can predict equilibria using strengths of acids, or really weaknesses of acids, by looking at pKa values, or we could look at the stability of the bases. They should both point to the same answer. Okay, so that's what Bronsted acids and bases are all about. Now let's look at a different kind of definition, the Lewis acid base. Lewis acids and Lewis bases have to do with electrons. And sometimes we see things that are acidic, but they don't even have any hydrogen ions uh, to be explained by with the Bronsted definition. So this is where the Lewis definition serves us better. A Lewis base is simply something that's electron rich. And in organic chemistry, we usually call that a nucleophile. Remember, the nucleus is positively charged. So nucleophile simply means it likes positive charge. A Lewis acid, on the other hand, is electron poor, and as such we call it an electrophile, meaning it likes electrons, it likes negative charges. So those words really remind us about how they behave. And this is important in organic reactions because some molecules have electron-rich parts and electron-poor parts, and it's those parts that will react with the counterpart. So we can design reactions knowing that the more nucleophilic site of a molecule it's going to react, the more react with the more electrophilic site of some other molecule, and we can predict how very complicated molecules might come together. So let's look at the different types of character we see in just a couple of simple examples down here. In each one, which is the most nucleophilic spot? Well, the best thing to look for is, are there unshared electrons that could go form a bond with something else? So I'm gonna draw in my lone pairs on this oxygen atom, and therein lies the answer. This is the most nucleophilic atom in the methanol molecule because of that pair of electrons. Likewise, right next to it in the ammonia molecule, there's a lone pair on the nitrogen, so that's the most nucleophilic atom. Conversely, down below, we're looking for the most electrophilic spot, the more electron-poor spot of the molecule. One of the best things to do for this is to look at dipoles, aka differences in electronegativity between two different atoms, like in A. We have a carbon-chlorine bond, and you should remember your halogens are very electronegative. That means they share electrons with someone else, but they don't share them equally. This carbon-chlorine bond is quite polarized toward the chlorine, so much so that they sometimes draw a partial negative on an atom and a partial positive on the other atom. Those aren't formal charges, but it means that this carbon feels a little more electron poor as a result. The carbon-hydrogen bond is essentially nonpolar. There's not too much of an electronegativity difference there, but the chlorine takes density away from that carbon atom. Right next to it, same argument, but even more pronounced. You've got three very electronegative fluorine atoms attached to this poor boron atom that has no electron density around it at all. So that's the atom I'm gonna circle. And furthermore, it's not even satisfying the octet uh, the octet rule, so very electron poor species. Okay, there's two others in each of those sets. I'd like you to hit pause again. In these two molecules, acetone and methoxide, where's the most nucleophilic spot? And then also in acetone and then just the HCl molecule, where's the most electrophilic spot? Hit pause, try that, see how you do. Okay, in acetone, uh, the most nucleophilic spot would be where I have my lone pairs, so the oxygen atom 
right next to it, same thing with the methoxide. There's three lone pairs, one, two, three. So the oxygen, also bearing the negative charge, is gonna be the most nucleophilic spot. Down below, I'm looking for dipoles. The carbon-oxygen double bond is definitely polarized towards the oxygen, so that means the carbon is the most electrophilic spot. And then there's also a dipole in the HCl molecule pointing toward the chlorine atom, so it's the hydrogen that's the more electron poor spot. Now, let's apply this to a simple organic reaction that involves a nucleophile and an electrophile. And I'm gonna add curved arrows just to show what bond broke and what bond formed. I'm gonna do one more thing though. I'm gonna actually label who's the nucleophile and who's the electrophile. So between these two molecules, I can see from reactants to products, we formed a new bond between this oxygen and a carbon. What carbon was this? Well, it came from this chloroethane molecule here. So if I think about where my most electron poor spot in this chloroethane molecule is, it's gonna be that carbon right there, the one that's attached to the chlorine atom. For the same reason we said in these molecules up above, there's a dipole pointing toward that electronegative chlorine. The most electron rich spot is gonna be this negatively charged oxygen. So that's my nucleophilic spot and that's my electrophilic spot. And once I've identified that, I simply draw an arrow from one to the other. Nucleophiles attack electrophiles. So I have an arrow from the oxygen to the carbon. That shows the new bond that's formed. But there's also a bond that broke. It's this carbon-chlorine bond. Where did those electrons go? They ended up on the chlorine atom. So I need one more curved arrow that shows that bond breaks and the electrons end up on the chlorine. So there's our first nucleophile slash electrophile mechanism. And we'll see a lot more of those as we go forward in this course. That's actually called an SN2 reaction. And you've made uh, a functional group known as an ether. So congrats, now you know how to make an ether. Okay, so this was all about acids and bases today. Uh, we started off talking about Bronsted acids and bases. Those are things that respectively lose H plus ions or gain H plus ions to become conjugates. Uh, we can talk about strength or stability in terms of pKa values or resonance stabilization, particularly for bases and anions. And then we use curved arrows to show how bonds break and bonds form in acid-base reactions, and we'll see in all kinds of reactions that we continue to do throughout this year. Thanks for watching.